So this is the fifth uh, film in the Rethinking Existentialism series. And in this film, I'm going to talk about the relation between existentialism and psychoanalysis. Because this is, I think, usually misrepresented. It's usually set up as a kind of opposition. So the idea is, is um, usually presented that uh, existentialism is a rejection of psychoanalysis, or at least of the classical Freudian uh, kind of psychoanalysis. Um, and I think there are very good reasons why it's usually set up that way. And Sartre and Beauvoir certainly reject Freud's uh, theory of, of the mind, uh, of the structure of the mind. And as a result, they reject his uh, theory of the origins of motivation um, and so the origins of behaviour. But despite those disagreements, um, uh, Beauvoir and Sartre both uh, find a lot of valuable uh, insight in Freud's work, and they both want to preserve that kind of insight, uh, or those insights, and, and they want to preserve the, the Freudian idea of, of, of psychoanalysis more broadly, whilst rejecting his theory of mind. Um, so I think it's a shame to focus on that um, uh, disagreement at, to, to the exclusion of the agreement. And I think once you see the disagreement in the in the context of the broader agreement, it it comes to seem less important the disagreement. Um, you know, rather than looking like they disagree with Freud on something so fundamental they must just reject everything Freud says, it rather looks like they agree with Freud uh, on much of. Uh, uh, his understanding at a, a kind of surface level of what's going on uh, in the mind and what's going on when, when people have problems uh, that they seek the help of psychoanalysis to solve. Um, but they disagree with the theoretical structures that Freud postulated in order to explain his clinical findings. Um, and they want to postulate a different set of um, theoretical structures which they think provide uh, a better explanation of those findings. So in this sense, uh, I want to say that, look, existentialism actually stands in the Freudian tradition. Right? When Sartre and Beauvoir both talk about their own form of existentialist psychoanalysis, they don't mean that as um, a rejection of Freud. They mean to be contributing to the Freudian psychoanalytic tradition, um, setting out a particular variety of it, and one that they think is uh, ultimately that builds on um, but is better than uh, Freud's original form. So what is it that they reject about Freud? They reject what's become known, uh, and, I, and I don't really understand why, but it's become known as Freud's metapsychology. Um, basically his theory of mind, his philosophy of mind, his theory of um, the structures of what's, uh, of motivation. Okay, and this is the famous theory of uh, the conscious and the unconscious. Um, at least that's how Freud starts uh, describing this division in the mind that he, he wants to, he wants to uh, describe. Um, as his work progresses uh, through his life, he brings in a variety of other terminologies and distinctions, uh, and he talks particularly about the ego and the id and the superego. Um, uh, in, uh, in a book in 1931, I think. Um, but throughout those changes in terminology, there's a basic underlying structure that remains the same, even though he, uh, he wants to uh, describe it from different perspectives and in different ways, and, and sometimes revise some of the details of, of what he says about it. And the basic underlying structure is a, still, I think, a kind of dualism, right? He wants to divide the mind between uh, those uh, uh, functions of the mind or those uh, items in the mind which are um, subject to rationality, um, which he calls being subject to the reality principle on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, uh, the, the items and functions and um, uh, processes in the mind which are basically irrational and subject to what he calls the pleasure principle. Um, so what is this distinction? Well, so the rational processes and items, as I see it, are 
they're subject to the reality principle partly because they are um, sensitive to the way the world in fact is so think about beliefs the beliefs you have about the world about you know where you live or um, uh, uh, what, what, what the weather is like at the moment or uh, your social surroundings or any of those beliefs those are at least attempting to track reality they're, they're attempting to uh, uh, there are features of your mind that are attempting to inform you about the way things in fact are okay so that's one feature uh, of, the, of the rational structure of the mind but another feature is that those uh, aspects of your mind are sensitive to one another they're rationally sensitive to one another they're governed by principles of inference and non-contradiction in particular so if you have two contradictory beliefs uh, which I'm sure we all have contradictory beliefs but it's when you come to notice that two things that you think uh, can't both be true at the same time um, that seems to you a reason to work out which one's wrong uh, one of them must be wrong and you, and, you, and you try to work that out and that's because uh, they're parts of your mind that are governed by the reality principle if they can't both be true they're not both correctly tracking reality so so the contradiction has to be resolved um, similarly you can infer something you can draw a conclusion from other things that you believe and thereby seem to expand your knowledge of reality on the basis of of the, of the knowledge that you already had okay so those are kind of rational processes of inference uh, uh, and of, of tracking um, the way things are and then there's the irrational things um, which uh, Freud's paradigm examples are, are drives which are kind of basic desires and these are um, uh, governed by the pleasure principle pleasure is just the satisfaction of a desire I think in Freud's understanding of it so all that means is that your desires or drives are items that um, the features of your mind that want to be satisfied okay and then you have lots of these so for example hunger right or thirst if you're thirsty that's a drive to drink some water or you know satisfy the desire for for a drink um, if you're hungry that's a, a drive to get some food and it's you know its aim is not to tell you anything about the world its aim is not to not to be coherent with your other beliefs about the world or anything of the sort its aim is to um, get you to eat some food uh, which will satisfy or drink some water which will satisfy the drive and then you have lots of other I mean that, that, those are kind of basic drives and the sex drive is another basic drive um, for Freud but also drives then combine into complexes of drives um, so you get quite complicated uh, sets of desires uh, but these as I say are not governed by rational rules of inference or non-contradiction they're not governed by um, uh, trying to re represent the way the world really is or the way anything really is um, uh, and they are essentially governed by trying to express themselves and, and, and become satisfied in, in action and is that dualism that underlies his, his difference between the, the unconscious and the conscious right it's not simply that the um, that the irrational ones are the unconscious ones right because some of your um, drives are perfectly conscious you know that you're hungry when you're hungry you know that you're thirsty when you're thirsty right that, that, there's nothing um, mysterious about that the, the the mystery comes into the mind uh, for Freud in that some of your drives and particularly some complexes of drives um, like the Oedipus complex um, are uh, uh, desires for things which are socially disapproved of and which are forbidden and as a result you not only refuse to act on those drives you also refuse to acknowledge those drives you refuse to believe you even have those desires and so you and so you repress them and that's the basic Freudian idea of repression and then that repression can cause trouble for you as those drives try to express themselves and try to try to become satisfied in your behavior even despite uh, uh, your your repression of them um, so the so the dynamically unconscious the repressed um, drives uh, are, are, um, are uh, the problematic ones that need to be uncovered and understood in psychoanalysis whereas other drives are perfectly conscious um, and all the rational um, 
uh, rationally structured um, features of your mind that obey the reality principle are all consciously accessible and they have to be consciously accessible right because um, uh, one of the principles that governs their structure is that they're available for inference that you can draw inferences on the basis of uh, of these mental items and that means that you can draw the inference that you have the mental item okay so if you believe that you know it's raining outside um, which it isn't but if you believe it is um, then you can infer from that that you have the belief that it's raining outside right so the rationally structured items in the mind are available for inference and as a result they're available to self-awareness um, so they're conscious now Sartre's criticism of this is that that's all very well but how do we explain this attitude this activity of repression and denial and uh, and the, the related um, phenomenon of resistance which supposedly is what happens when the psychoanalyst is getting close to the truth and they and they start to hint toward the patient or ask them well do you think maybe you know maybe you're suffering from the Oedipus complex or whatever it is they ask and because this complex is repressed and the patient won't admit it they resist and they and they and they refuse to believe what the analyst is saying um, how is all that to be explained according Sartre asks according to Freud's theory of the mind what is it to be censoring uh, features of your own mind so that you are no you can't become aware of them to make them dynamically unconscious to keep them out of the conscious mind what kind of activity is that that censorship it can't be itself an irrational activity a, just another drive or desire that obeys the pleasure principle why not because it wouldn't work it, it, it would it, in order to successfully censor um, uh, desires that are socially disapproved of you need to know what society disapproves of and you need to know the content of the desires that uh, are trying to become expressed in your behavior and you need to be able to compare the two and you need to be able to work out whether or not you can successfully repress a particular desire and so on and those are all rational processes they all involve inference they will involve the reality principle they involve understanding the social reality that surrounds you and also understanding the reality of the drives what the what the drives are okay so it looks like repression itself uh, censorship whatever you want to call it is itself a rational process but in that case it should be conscious and if it was conscious it wouldn't work right if you just knew that you were censoring your Oedipus complex then you wouldn't succeed in censoring your Oedipus complex because you'd know you had it because you'd know you were censoring it okay that's it that's the essence of Sartre's criticism of Freud that Freud's metapsychology fails to explain what it's supposed to explain because there's no resources in that metapsychology in that theory of mind to explain how repression and resistance and denial and censorship and all these crucial Freudian uh, uh, things can happen right. so that's um, why Freud fails according to Sartre and I think Beauvoir goes along with this Beauvoir doesn't uh, develop this argument specifically herself but she does refer to Sartre's discussion uh, uh, of Freud so what's the existentialist alternative well the existentialist alternative is to say that we're not going to talk about uh, the conscious and the unconscious or the rational and the irrational or the reality principle and the pleasure principle or any of that we're not even going to try and translate that language into a new we're just going to get rid of it and give a, a, a new account of the mind right and that's the account and of motivation and behavior in particular and that's the account that they build on the idea of a project and so that's the account that is the basis of existentialism which is what I've been talking about in all of these films the idea that existence precedes essence the idea that um, uh, uh, what drives a person's behavior is ultimately the projects that they have chosen to pursue the values that they have endorsed and that they continue to endorse and that they can in some sense abandon no Sartre and Beauvoir disagree on what that sense is um, I'll come to that in a minute so that's that's the that's the existentialist alternative um, that is compatible 
with the idea that you might be unaware of the root causes of some problematic behaviour or some problematic desires that you have. Right, so that's the basic idea of psychoanalysis. You might be, you might, you might be distressed by some of your behaviour or uh, or some of your desires and not know what to do about it or where they're coming from, um, and need the help of an analyst uh, to to uncover that. Um, on Sartre's view, that is to be explained by the very fact that projects uh, structure your experience. So as I've already uh, explained in these films. You know, Sartre's view is not just that you have projects and you have values, but that the way you experience things that you experience, uh, the way you experience the world and the way you experience yourself is filtered through the lens of those projects. And that's why you experience the world as having the particular structure of reasons that you experience it as having. Right? Um, that it, it prohibits certain things and invites other things as a result of the behaviour, of the, of the values that you have. And because that's true of your experience generally, it's not just true of your experience of, of the world around you, of alarm clocks and signs that tell you to keep off the grass, it's also true of your awareness of yourself. And so your own projects can occlude um, uh, features of your own projects. Because when you come to reflect on yourself and think about your own values and think about your own projects, you're doing that through the lens of your own values and projects. So a good example of this is um, Sartre's explanation of the inferiority complex. So the inferiority complex is something that Freud talks about and Sartre takes it on and says look I can explain that too with my theory of mind. What's going on is this, um, the person suffering the inferiority complex has chosen the project of inferiority. It's their project to try and prove that they are inferior to other people, that they just, there's something about them which means that they can't achieve the things that other people can achieve. And they prove this by um, setting about goals that are just unachievable for them or, or trying to achieve them in ways uh, which they, which they, which, which you could not achieve them, right? So deciding one day that you want to be a concert pianist, even though you've never played the piano before. Right. It's just an unrealistic goal, not because you personally are in some way naturally inferior. It's just that that's not how you become a concert pianist. Um, and so Sartre thinks not only that that's what the inferiority project is, but as a result of having that project, if you then reflect on your own motivations, that project itself is going to hide your genuine motivation. Right? You, you're not going to succeed in proving to yourself that you're naturally inferior. If you, if you at the same time you could admit that that's what you're trying to prove. So when you reflect on your own values and your own projects, the inferiority project itself is going to filter that information uh, uh, and make it look as though you are genuinely trying to achieve things that other people could genuinely achieve and that if you fail it's genuinely because there's something wrong with you. Okay, so that's Sartre's idea of psychoanalysis in a nutshell. All it can do is uncover the projects that you are pursuing, but which you've lost sight of as a result of uh, your reflection being f filtered or structured or, or, or shaped by your own projects. Okay. Okay. So I'll say that again. Um, because your reflection on your own motivations is itself through the lens of your projects, that can mean that there are features of your own projects that you can't notice, you can't see through your own reflection, but through reflecting on them yourself, uh, because your outlook is shaped by your projects. And it takes a, a psychoanalyst, or indeed just somebody else with a different set of projects and a different lens, seeing your motivation through a different lens, seeing your behaviour through a different lens, uh, to be able to uncover what the problematic projects are. Simone de Beauvoir, on the other hand, although I think she may agree with all of that, she's got further resources to explain why people can end up in uh, with behaviour uh, or desires that they find distressing. Because Simone de Beauvoir, as I said in the previous film, uh, believes in sedimentation. Uh, as far as she's concerned, projects become weightier. They become uh, more uh, deeply embedded, uh, more influential 
over somebody's outlook uh, uh, the, the longer they are pursued and the more they are pursued and that's not just true of the values uh, at the heart of those projects but it's also true of any kind of social meanings that get incorporated into those projects and that's um, Beauvoir's theory of gender, right? So because you want, as you grow up as a child, you want to you want to be praised and thanked, and you don't want to be uh, told off. You know, you do the things for which you get praised, and that trains you to kind of have the values to value those things and to pursue those things as your values. And as you grow up, these values become quite sedimented and quite embedded in your outlook, and they shape your outlook. And it may be uh, uh, later in life you reject all of that and you reject that uh, conditioning. Um, but even if you do, it's it's kind of too late. You've already been conditioned. So although um, you no longer uh, believe in the things that, that you were, that the values you were uh, uh, trained to uh, to have instilled in your outlook, um, they are still there and they are still shaping your desires and they're still shaping your attitudes in ways that you might not notice, in ways that you might not even realise. So on Beauvoir's view, one aim of psychoanalysis is to diagnose um, the root causes of distress, not just in people's projects that are hidden from them by the fact that they only see themselves through the lens of their own projects, but also through um, uh, the conflict that can arise between the values that we do endorse, the projects that we do want to pursue on the one hand, and on the other hand, the values that have been embedded in us by our social conditioning. Right? There can be a conflict between those two things, and it can be a conflict which isn't obvious to us that that's what the problem is. It rather um, it can be that we find ourselves doing things that we don't agree with. We find ourselves wanting things that we actually, on reflection, reject. And that, that can be distressing. And the cause of it, as I say, is the conflict between the values that have become deeply embedded and then the more recently uh, adopted values, the ones that you reflectively endorse, that you think are the right values, but which you haven't been pursuing long enough for them to have become your deeply embedded values and to displace the other ones. Okay, so that... Um, it briefly, is how Sartre and Beauvoir end up with different forms of psychoanalysis, which I think they both think of as uh, standing in the Freudian tradition, different forms of existential psychoanalysis or existentialist psychoanalysis uh, due to uh, their differing understandings of um, the ways in which projects uh, shape our experience. Uh, their differing uh, conceptions of what it means to say existence precedes essence.